Hi, good morning everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm really excited to be here and have this opportunity to talk about um, some very important conditions. Now, many of you in this room may not have scleroderma, um, but I still hope that this talk is helpful, at least in bringing public awareness about this very serious condition. And also because as we go along and discuss scleroderma, you'll see that there can actually be a lot of overlapping features or symptoms in scleroderma that you might see in your own condition as well, but that does not automatically mean you have scleroderma. Um, scleroderma is something that I'm very passionate about. It's something that I used to attend at, um, at UCSF as the attending in the scleroderma clinic. So again, I'm really happy to be here. So I hope by the end of this talk, I'll be able to help answer some of these basic questions and that includes, well, what exactly is scleroderma and what are some of its symptoms and how do you diagnose it? And additionally, what's Raynaud's phenomenon, which can be related to scleroderma? Um, and lastly, how do we treat these conditions? So I'd like to start with a recent patient that I actually just saw, um, and she's not here today, but she gave me permission. But she's a 47-year-old woman who had come see me several months ago with recent development of severe hand stiffness and pain, and I think many of us can relate to that in this room. On exam, she did have some swelling in her finger joints, but she had no skin findings. Her tests for rheumatoid arthritis were normal, and an ANA test, which is this frequent screening test we do for autoimmune diseases, just a few months ago had been normal. So I gave her a low dose of prednisone and she felt within days to weeks that her joints felt markedly better. However, several months later when she came back for a routine follow-up, she had mentioned what she was noticing some new skin changes and that when she was cold, she was noticing that her fingers were starting to turn blue, which is what Reno's can present with. And and along the back of her neck, interestingly, she had this new discoloration of her skin. We call this the salt and pepper um, discoloration, which can be associated with scleroderma. Her blood tests were rechecked at this point. Remember, they had just been normal several months ago. And now her ANA test was highly positive. And she also had a very scleroderma-specific blood test called SCL70 that was positive. And so I gave her a new diagnosis of scleroderma. And the reason I wanted to start with this case is because it's a humbling moment where it demonstrates how difficult it can be to diagnose certain conditions like scleroderma, even for experienced rheumatologists, but also stresses the importance of follow-up with your physician or your rheumatologist because in autoimmune diseases, things can change with time and the answer is not always obvious in the beginning. So what exactly is scleroderma? What does it mean? In its most literal form, it means hard skin. It thankfully is relatively rare in the US, only about 300,000 people in the US. Women are much more likely to get in than men. And the age of onset is highly, highly variable, but it usually presents in adulthood, in their 20s to their 50s. And what happens in scleroderma is that there are changes that occur in the skin where in the early part of scleroderma there's a lot of inflammation followed by scarring and then buildup of collagen which is what gives scleroderma that hard texture. So in this bottom left graphic, um, which I hope you can appreciate, um, I just wanted to emphasize that on the bottom part where you see the blue um, are skin biopsies taken from people with healthy skin and people with scleroderma skin. And you'll see that on the right side with the scleroderma skin, there's a lot more intense blue um, compared to healthy skin. And what that's trying to demonstrate is that there's a lot more collagen buildup um, in people with scleroderma. How do we make a diagnosis of scleroderma? And this is really c complex in certain conditions. So first and foremost, of course, we want to take a very good physical exam. Most importantly, we want to take a look at the skin to see if there's any skin changes that we see with scleroderma, and we're going to go over some of the examples of those various skin changes. But also, we take a very close listen to your lungs, take a look at your joints, and also your muscles, because scleroderma can affect many parts of the body other than the skin. We also run numerous blood tests, as you may have um, already had experience with. Most patients, but not all, but most patients with scleroderma will have a positive ANA test. And then additionally, we'll run certain specific specialized tests for scleroderma, like the SCL70 antibody, the centromere antibody, the RNA polymerase antibody, and the PMSCL antibody. 
And this gives us a sense of what type of scleroderma this person might develop, what type of complications we might expect. Um, and lastly, we may also recommend certain types of imaging, such as CAT scans of the lung or ultrasounds of the heart, because scleroderma can unfortunately have significant impact on these vital organs as well. The skin findings in scleroderma can be very variable. And you know, when um, I was at UCSF scleroderma clinic, it would sometimes be almost comical because we would have three different rheumatologists and a dermatologist who are all experienced in this. And we would literally stare at people's hands and all try to pinch it. And we would have different opinions uh, possibly about whether or not this patient actually had skin thickening. In the limited form of scleroderma, where there is less skin involvement, some people may just simply have skin thickening in the fingers. We call this sclerodactyly, or hardening of the fingers. And typically, if you, if you, and you can do this right now, if you took your hand and if you took the skin between your um, middle joint and the small joint at the tip of your finger, you would be able to pinch the skin, and you would be able to see wrinkles fold as you pinch that skin. But in people with sclerodactyly or hardening of this finger skin, there would be a slight shine to it because it's become more thickened with the collagen. There's been some scarring. And you would not be able to actually pinch that skin. You would just not be able to move that skin. So this is an example of the um, sclerodactyly. And this comes from a woman that I recently saw who's 65. And she says, well, actually, my hands have been like this for several years. And she had never thought anything of it. Um, she was just happy to see me for her Reno's phenomenon, which we'll talk about. So again, sclerodactyly can be subtle. Other times, unfortunately, the scleroderma can be very obvious. And so this is a more obvious example of skin thickening, where the skin becomes so tight that the hand actually starts to contract. And you can see this very bright sheen to the overall appearance of the hand. And because it becomes so tight, their hands actually contract. Um, in its most severe form, unfortunately, scleroderma can be so diffuse that people literally tell us that I feel like I'm a mannequin because I just can't move my skin. Other times, this skin thickening may not be so evident or so obvious. Um, this is a woman who I saw in Dublin who, again, did not note, complain of any problems with skin thickening per se, but on her exam, she, she did have these various, you might be able to see, um, red spots along her forehead, along her um, cheeks. Oh, there's a pointer. Uh, oh, great. So here are some examples. But she actually has them diffusely throughout her face. And these are just benign dilated blood vessels called telangiectasias that are very characteristic of limited scleroderma, otherwise known as crest. This is a, a, perhaps a little bit too <laughs> esoteric, but other times we can see other very subtle features of scleroderma. Um, such as darkening of the skin just around your hands. Again, this woman um, was eventually diagnosed with scleroderma, but she, initially she had no problems with skin thickening. But you can tell that along her fingers, it's much darker than the rest of her forearm. Um, and another skin manifestation that's more subtle of scleroderma is that they may not complain of skin tightening, but they get this puffy hand appearance. And we literally call it a puffy hand experience for. Sometimes scleroderma can be much more restricted to um, limited parts of the body. This is a woman who just has what we call linear scleroderma, or en coup de sabre, which in French means a cut of the sword, where just it's as if you, so there's a, a single line that runs along the scalp and the forehead um, with scleroderma changes. But scleroderma is really a misnomer in the sense that scleroderma actually is more than skin deep it unfortunately can most very often affect many other organs um, in the body. So a better term that doctors are moving towards is renaming scleroderma systemic sclerosis, emphasizing that it's just not a skin condition, but really systemically throughout the body, there can be hardening um, and scarring of the body. So for example, it can affect the GI tract. People often have heartburn and severe constipation. It can also affect the heart and the lungs. And these are the more severe complications that we screen for very carefully 
it can be associated with high blood pressure in the lungs. We call this pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PH. And also, which we'll talk a little about um, in a bit, it can cause inflammation and scarring in the lungs. We call this interstitial lung disease, or ILD. In the past, one of the major causes of death, actually, among scleroderma, which thankfully we don't see as much anymore, was that it could affect the kidneys, where people's kidneys would start shutting down and their blood pressure would reach dangerously high levels. We call this scleroderma renal crisis. Rarely, it can cause scarring and inflammation in the heart, which requires a lung transplant at times. And this um, blood flow can be so restricted in your hands that people start getting wounds or ulcers along the fingertips, which um, I'll show you examples of in a bit. When we make a diagnosis of scleroderma, the m m one of the most immediate things that I tell patients is that everyone is different. And some people can have very mild, and some people can have very severe scleroderma. And we unfortunately at this time don't have great tests that can help predict what, how severe yours will be or what organs will be. But um, sometimes the degree of skin involvement can help us predict, well, how, what's the likelihood that you're going to develop the more life-threatening complications of scleroderma outside the skin. People with more diffuse, more widespread skin thickening, which we call diffuse scleroderma, are at higher risk of developing the lung inflammation, the ILD. They're also at slightly higher risk for pulmonary arterial hypertension, for kidney disease, and also for muscle involvement. But you can even see that in um, people with limited disease, again, people with more restricted areas of hardening of the skin, they are still at risk for certain complications like pulmonary arterial hypertension. We use blood tests to help try to predict these complications. So for example, people with limited scleroderma tend to have a higher incidence of the centromere antibody, whereas people who had the diffuse type have a higher incidence of having these SCL70 and RNA polymerase through the antibodies. But even these very specialized blood tests are not perfect, and they are not reliable predictors of how severe will be. And so, for example, just several weeks ago, I saw a woman who has an RNA polymerase 3 antibody, and she had diffuse skin thickening, and she's had this actually for over 10 years, but surprisingly, and thankfully, even over the course of 10 years, she has not developed any of these other major organ involvements. So we're constantly humbled and in search of trying to develop better blood tests of determining how severe and how widespread is the scleroderma is going to be. Excitingly, just a year and a half ago, there was a major, major study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that t um, discovered that there was a new chemical or a new inflammatory marker that uh, was studied in patients with scleroderma. And it suggests that perhaps that this chemical that is measurable in the blood may help predict how severe someone's scleroderma will be. This chemical was something was uh, called CXCL4. It is a chemical that's produced by a very special type of immune cell called plasmacytodendritic cells. But in this landmark study, they were able to show that in patients with scleroderma, they had much, much higher levels of CXCL4, not only compared to healthy um, patients, but also importantly, much higher compared to other autoimmune diseases, so including lupus, enclosing spondylitis, and hepatic fibrosis, suggesting that this chemical is unique to patients with scleroderma. In addition, they were able to show that the higher the level of CXCL4, the more severe their skin disease was. So for example, people with both early and late scleroderma were likely to have much higher levels of CXCL4 compared to those with this limited form of scleroderma. Additionally, they were able to show, and I didn't put their slide here, that people with high levels of CXCL4 were also much more likely to develop the severe complications such as ILD and pulmonary arterial hypertension. This blood test is not yet commercially available for routine clinical use. It is um, patented by the people who uh, made this discovery, um, but it is starting to be used in, at least for research purposes, at least in clinical trials.
Normally, as rheumatologists, I do not like to talk about mortality and associated with rheumatologic conditions because, again, everybody is different. Um, and I, one of the reasons we love rheumatology is that most of our conditions are treatable and become um, lifelong conditions. But I do want to mention that scleroderma is or was um, a life-threatening condition. It used to be that if someone was given a diagnosis of scleroderma in the 70s, the likelihood that they would be alive 10 years after their diagnosis was only about 50%, unfortunately. Thankfully, our understanding of scleroderma continues to improve year by year. And in the most recent study, at least in the late 70s, the survival rate of scleroderma patients had increased significantly. At that point, it was now 70% were alive 10 years after their diagnosis. But I don't like to mention the 70% because, again, year by year, our, our treatments are changing and improving. I include this slide just to demonstrate an example of how quickly things are changing for scleroderma patients. In the 70s, again, there was a very high mortality rate associated with scleroderma, specifically because of this, well, the scleroderma renal crisis, where, again, the kidney shuts down and the blood pressure shoots dangerously high. Of scleroderma-related deaths in the 70s, 40% of people died because of this condition. But because of the advent of a very common, simple blood pressure medication, that risk has significantly declined. And now it is, I have to say, I've only seen one case of this in my entire uh, medical experience. And at that point, we treated that patient very quickly, and she did well. Because people are living longer with scleroderma, thankfully, however, this has allowed for more slow or indolent complications of scleroderma um, to, to grow over time. So for example, now that people are living longer and longer with scleroderma, they are developing more and more um, interstitial lung disease or inflammation in their lung because they are able to live longer. So interstitial lung disease is now one of the um, major causes of death in scleroderma. But again, the treatments are getting better. And um, just to show you a quick picture of what does it look like when we're looking for interstitial lung disease, this is a CAT scan of someone with, um, that I had diagnosed with early scleroderma. And normally in this uh, view of the CAT scan, your lung would simply look mostly black. Um, that black area represents healthy air space. But at the bottom of this um, woman's lung, you can see that there is this white patchy scar tissue. And what has happened here is that there has been early inflammation that has scarred down, causing this um, net-like lacy pattern, um, which again is characteristic of interstitial lung disease. This is our biggest fear, because this is the organ that, if it fails, you know, the skin is more uncomfortable, it's cosmetic, but if the lung fails, of course, that can be associated with high mortality. Thankfully, we are getting better at treating ILD. There was a very important study that was just presented at our national conference last fall, and we've been waiting a long time for this data, that demonstrates that CELSEPT, a medicine that's frequently used in severe lupus or in people who receive lung transplant and other autoimmune diseases, that CELSEPT, otherwise known as mycophenolate mofetil, can actually help improve um, ILD. It used to be that we would give cytoxan. Cytoxan is a form of aggressive chemotherapy. It's frequently used for breast cancer or also severe lupus. Um, but we gave cytoxan somewhat reluctantly because of its potential toxicities. Um, but thankfully, the studies demonstrated that cell set can actually be helpful in stabilizing ILD. So you'll see that um, along the vertical line is a measure of someone's lung function. And typically, in someone with scleroderma, before we had treatments, their lung function would continue to persistently downtrend with time without treatment. But with both cytoxin and CELSEP, you can see that we are now actually having gains in lung function rather than deterioration. So we remain optimistic that our therapies will continue to improve. How we treat scleroderma is really individual dependent and it depends on what organs need treatment for. So for example, if people have just simply sclerodactyly or thickening of the skin along the fingers, then they may never require any treatment because 
um, their skin thickening will just always for the rest of their life just remain restricted, thankfully, to just their fingers. However, in people with diffuse or widespread scleroderma changes, then we will be a little bit more aggressive and consider the use of immune suppressing medications, some of which are used for other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, including methotrexate. And there was a very important study recently by Hopkins that showed that perhaps IVIG could be helpful for scleroderma. There are some experimental therapies. I do not advocate for these because of its limited data. In Europe and in Washington state, they are big fans of trying bone marrow transplants for very severe widespread scleroderma, but I do not recommend that um, because in our experience with Hopkins um, and also Washington, it's been shown that Interestingly, even though if people get a bone marrow transplant, their scleroderma might temporarily improve for several months, if not a few years, their experience has been that several years later after the transplant, the scleroderma comes right back, and unfortunately, it comes up even more aggressively. For interstitial lung disease, again, more and more we're moving towards CELCEPT. We still sometimes do use cytoxin. In very severe cases of end-stage lung disease from scleroderma, there are a few academic centers, including UCSF, who will do a lung transplant for these patients. Now, I hope at the end of this talk, I hope that if you are worried that you have hard skin, that does not automatically mean that you have scleroderma. There are many, many things that can mimic scleroderma and cause hard skin. And so it's important to see a dermatologist and or a rheumatologist if you have hard skin. There are other conditions that are not scleroderma, such as scleromyxedema, nephrogenic fibrosyn dermopathy, eosinic fasciitis, and scleroderma, and certain types of chemical exposures such as PVC that can cause hard skin, and that does not mean that you have scleroderma. Um, just to clarify a few of these things, so nephrogenic fibrosyn dermopathy is a very fatal form of hard, um, hardening of the skin that happens in people um, who have severe kidney disease and they get contrast during an MRI. And then eosinophilic fasciitis, I'm going to show you an example of. This is um, uh, something that looks just like scleroderma often, but if you see a good dermatologist or a good rheumatologist, they'll be able to help tell to the difference because oftentimes people with eosinophilic fasciitis, curiously, will have this groove, this indentation along um, their forearm. Um, along the veins, and um, as a scleroderma specialist, we often got referrals from dermatologists for scleroderma who we would pick up on this subtle finding and actually give them a different diagnosis of eosinophagitis. So again, it's important to see someone who has experience with these conditions. I'm going to change topic a little bit here to talk more about Renos specifically. And certainly people can have Renos without having an autoimmune disease or without scleroderma, but there can be a strong relationship between the two, um, which is why I felt appropriate to talk about both conditions um, in the same talk. 90% of people with scleroderma will have Renos phenomenon. And so having Renos phenomenon can be a very useful diagnostic clue when we're trying to figure out what this patient has. When I try to, now, it might seem, well, Raynaud's is just cold hands, or, but the, how we diagnose the Raynaud's phenomenon is actually quite controversial. There are actually numerous multinational communities that try to come up with consensus statements of how do we define Raynaud's phenomenon. And so what I usually ask is, one, do your fingers feel really sensitive to cold? Now, 12% of the general population will say yes. That does not automatically mean that you have Raynaud's phenomenon. The real uh, clinching point is whether or not do you notice that your fingers actually change color? Specifically, do they notice white or do they suddenly turn dark blue and purple? And if you don't have these color changes, then it is not Raynaud's phenomenon. It, you can be healthy without Raynaud's phenomenon and feel that you have very cold hands. I have very cold hands. You know, cold hands, warm heart. Um, but only about 3 to 5% of the population actually have Raynaud's phenomenon. And so these are just some illustrations of people with Raynaud's phenomena. Again, it's usually very striking. It's not enough to say that you simply have cold hands. You must see color changes of dark blue or purple or um, a very obvious white in this example. It can also very commonly affect the toes. 
Now, the vast majority of people with renal nodes phenomenon, usually they just notice these symptoms in their fingers and their toes, but it can affect actually in many uh, far parts of your body. It can affect the tongue, it can affect the ear and the nose even. This is a great illustration that was published in the Journal of Medicine, where this is a young woman in South Korea. You can see that when she's cold, her tongue actually turns quite um, ghostly white. Now, um, I don't want people to panic because 90% of the people with brain nodes phenomenon usually have what we call primary brain nodes phenomenon. This means that they have brain nodes phenomenon without any underlying autoimmune disease. Um, and there are certain clues that we try to ask about that might suggest that, hey, don't worry, your brain nodes phenomenon is most likely just primary. You're very unlikely to develop an underlying autoimmune disease. So for example, if you're very young and you start getting Raynaud's phenomenon, it's most likely that you have primary. If um, you have very mild Raynaud's, again, you just have a few minutes of it and it's not very severe, it's most likely to be primary and you're not going to get an autoimmune disease. If you have a family member who has Raynaud's phenomenon, it also increases the likelihood that you simply have primary Raynaud's phenomenon. That being said, um, Sometimes we do see people who are older in life who get primary Raynaud's phenomenon and we just watch them periodically to make sure that they don't develop any signs of a more serious autoimmune disease. Physicians and researchers have actually studied Raynaud's phenomenon over long term to help try to identify predictors of whether or not someone with Raynaud's phenomena will actually later on develop an autoimmune disease. And fascinatingly, and to our surprise, it's not the, the, the best predictors are not the things that we would typically think of. So for example, having a positive ANA test is not a good predictor of whether or not you're going to get an autoimmune disease. Or having symptoms of scler uh, scleroderma, like digital ulcers or abnormal lung tests are not good predictors. The best predictor, surprisingly to all of us, for whether or not someone with a brain nodes phenomena would actually later develop an autoimmune disease was something called nail fold capillary pattern. And I'm going to show you a picture of this. So along your uh, fingernail bed, there are blood vessels. Normally, we can't see them. But in people with severe brain nodes phenomenon, they can develop dilatation of these blood vessels. And here are some illustrations of abnormal dilated blood vessels along the nail bed of the finger bed. And fascinatingly, if people have these dilated blood vessels, then you have a much higher chance of developing an autoimmune disease after you've been diagnosed with Raynaud's phenomenon. And in fact, if you have these dilated blood vessels, then there's a 50% chance that you will later on develop an autoimmune disease. And then if you have normal looking blood vessels, then it significantly lowers the risk that you will develop an autoimmune disease later in your life. So if you have Raynaud's phenomenon and you see a rheumatologist or you see any provider, um, what I like to do is I simply take some lubricant or some gel and you place it on your non-dominant hand. And then with our routine ophthalmoscope, we'll take a close look at those blood vessels and tell you whether or not they look dilated. Now, again, with Raynaud's phenomenon, 90% of the time, don't worry, it's not going to be associated with an autoimmune disease. But there can be a 10% risk, or more exact, 12% risk, that over the course of several years, you may start developing um, signs of an autoimmune disease. And in this landmark study, they followed 639 patients with Raynaud's phenomenon, and they followed them for several years after they were diagnosed with Raynaud's and saw what type of and how frequently what type of autoimmune diseases would develop. And you can see that number one, by far, the number one autoimmune disease that would later be diagnosed after someone developed Raynaud's phenomenon was scleroderma for systemic sclerosis. 65% of those who develop an autoimmune disease has scleroderma. Other autoimmune diseases that can be associated with um, Raynaud's phenomenon include mixed connective tissue disease, Sjogren's syndrome, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, and myositis. And I would say that the average time that had passed um, between being diagnosed with Raynaud's and an autoimmune disease was about three years. So the answer is not always obvious in the beginning.
what is happening in Reynolds' phenomenon? And I think this is a very good uh, visual representation of what happens during Reynolds' phenomenon. Now, normally, even in healthy individuals, when we're cold, the natural reflex is that the blood vessels in the periphery of our body will constrict. Some people think that this is an evolutionary mechanism by which we preserve um, our body heat. So when we're cold, the blood vessels in our periphery will constrict in order to shunt our blood towards the core of our body to preserve our body heat. So this is a heat um, ultrasound, basically, of what happens when people with different conditions put their hands in cold water. So on the far left corner, uh, far left column, is what happens when a healthy individual um, puts their hands in cold water. So purple is um, very, very cold, and then blue is very cold, and then red is warm or normal. So in a healthy individual, when they put their hands in um, cold water, you'll see that naturally and healthily, the blood vessels and the temperature in your fingers will drop because these blood vessels will constrict. But in a healthy individual, after you take your hands out of this cold water, after several minutes, those blood vessels will start to normally dilate and the blood will flow back. And so within the eight minutes, you'll see that the hand is again red and normal and warm. In someone with primary Raynaud's, um, without scleroderma, if they put their hands in cold water, they'll constrict actually much more so than in a healthy individual, which is why you see that purple, which means colder um, color. And even after they remove their hands from the cold water, it takes longer time for those blood vessels to dilate and go back to normal. So you'll see even eight to 15 minutes later after they take out of their hands out of the cold water, it's still not back to red, it's still not back to normal. In people with scleroderma renos phenomenon, it can be much more severe. You can see that not only is their hands much more um, cold and purple when they put their hands in the cold water, but even after 15 minutes of having their hands out in the normal room temperature, it still has this very cold purple appearance under a heat ultrasound. And so scleroderma renos phenomenon can be especially um, more severe and protracted. Oh, excuse me. It can be so protracted and severe that over time there can be so um, there can be a significant blood loss in the finger. So the tissue along the fingertip or the toe tip actually dies off, or actually we call it has necrosis or gangrene. So this is an unfortunate woman who I saw in Dublin who has such severe Raynaud's that essentially. Um, the very, very tip of her finger turned black, and that tissue essentially um, died. This can be so severe that people require amputations. How do we treat Raynaud's phenomenon? For most people with primary Raynaud's phenomenon, all you have to do is warm up your core body temperature. The most common, common misunderstanding about, among both patients and physicians is that they think, oh, all I have to do is warm up my hands because that's where I feel the cold. But that's actually a mistake because what controls your, your blood vessels and how your body senses your temperature is not in your hands, it's actually in your brain in the hypothalamus. So if you are having a Raynaud's phenomenon attack or episode, it's not simply enough to warm up your hands and your feet. You actually have to warm up your core temperature. And so sometimes you will see people who come into clinic with gloves um, and wearing a tank top. Uh, and we have, this, oh, we have a long discussion about how it's not simply you have to warm up your hands. You need to wear a jacket and you need to warm up core temperature. If, warm, if the attacks are more frequent or more severe, then we will prescribe a medication. These are very, very common blood pressure medication called calcium channel blockers. Millions of Americans take them every day simply for high blood pressure. But they can also be used for our severe Raynaud's phenomenon because it works by helping your blood pressure by dilating your blood vessels. And you can imagine as you dilate your blood vessels, it also improves blood flow. There are some other medications we will less frequently try. So for example, sometimes people will notice that their Raynaud's get worse with stress and anxiety. There's something about the neurotransmitters that are released when they're feeling stressed that can also aggravate Raynaud's phenomenon. So in people who say that their Raynaud's phenomenon is often more associated with anxiety and stress, we may pr pr prescribe them Prozac. 
Um, Viagra or sildenafil is also very helpful because Viagra works in erectile dysfunction by dilating blood vessels and it also helps in Raynaud's phenomenon by helping dilate vessels. Um, and women usually get a kick out of it. <laughs> um, um, but we say please do not use as prescribed. <laughs> Uh, Nitrobid, which is the medication that some people may have here for their heart, can also be helpful for Raynaud's phenomenon because not only does it dilate the blood vessels in your heart, again, it can be helpful in dilating the blood vessels in your fingers. Um, rarely, and I have to say that I have never, except in one situation, recommended this procedure because it's a little bit controversial, but there is some data to suggest that if people have very, very severe Raynaud's phenomena, they may potentially benefit from a procedure known as a digital sympathectomy. This is essentially where a hand surgeon or a plastic surgeon will actually um, intentionally uh, nick one of your nerves um, in your hands, and this is thought to be helpful in some cases because the nerves um, if it's nicked, may prevent the contraction of the blood vessels. In very severe cases, we will also admit people into the hospital if their Raynaud's phenomenon is so severe they're about to lose their finger. We'll admit to them into the hospital and give them a very expensive and very potent medication that dilates their um, blood vessels called prostacyclin. Um, things are not always as it appear. If you notice that you're starting to get um, color changes when, and feeling cold in your digits, please see a rheumatologist or a, a good primary care physician because there are many things that can be um, similar to Raynaud's phenomenon but not actually be Raynaud's phenomenon. I'm going to give a few examples here. So um, I used to work in, I used to moonlight in urgent care, and I remember one time this very young 20-year-old college student came to urgent care because he was starting to feel that his fingers were turning blue and he was having palpitations, um, and he kind of, uh, they just kind of brushed it off that this was all due to caffeine use because it was finals time. But what I noticed was that his heart rate was very uh, uh, irregularly fast, and so I asked the mother to leave the room, and I asked him, flat out, what are you taking? And so without his mother there, he disclosed that he was actually taking Adderall off-label. Um, this is actually very common, um, unfortunately, I've learned through the circles. Um, um, but uh, many college students, unfortunately, are taking Adderall off-label without appropriate supervision because it's a stimulant and helps them study during the finals time. And so this was right, I circled, it was right before Christmas, and so he was taking his friend's Adderall to help study for finals. And this is a very good example of how many medications can create symptoms that are similar to Adderall. So, for example, I think many in this room might be taking a beta blocker, which is a very common blood pressure medication. Um, it is safe, but in some cases it can actually cause Raynaud's phenomenon and make it worse if you already have Raynaud's phenomenon. Certain types of migraine headache medications and amphetamines like Adderall can cause the blood vessels to constrict. Certain types of chemotherapy, like bleomycin and blistin, um, which is used for lung cancer, can also cause Raynaud's phenomena. Birth control pills and um, lithium, which is often used for bipolar disorder or other psychiatric illnesses, can also cause um, Raynaud's phenomena. And in that situation, we simply stop the medication and then the problem goes away. Um, this is another common example of something being mistaken for Raynaud's phenomenon in rheumatology. So recently I saw a few five year old woman, she was referred for Raynaud's phenomenon, and she said that her fingers were, and her toes were constantly um, blue and purplish after going to Lake Tahoe in January. But what was unusual for Raynaud's phenomenon um, was that she said this, this was itchy. Now Raynaud's phenomenon should not be itchy. Um, and it had lasted for at least three weeks, and Raynaud's phenomenon should usually just be episodic, it lasts for a few minutes or hours, um, and the, the duration of hers was very suspicious. And so what she actually has is not Raynaud's phenomenon, this is something called chill blains. And this is also an autoimmune condition, but it's totally unrelated to Raynaud's phenomenon, and can be treated with a topical steroid um, to reduce the inflammation. Um, so, again, if you're concerned about Raynaud's phenomenon, please see a rheumatologist because there are many conditions 
um, some autoimmune, some not autoimmune that can look like it. Um, and I've listed some examples, including medications, vasculitis, cryoglobinemia, embolic disease, chilblains, and phospholipid syndrome, which is associated with lupus, um, and thoracic outlet syndrome, acrocytinosis. Um, and we'll help you tease apart of whether or not you actually have a this phenomenon or something else that's causing this discoloration of your um, digits. Some take home points. So, systemic sclerosis can affect many organs, including skin, lung, joints. But these, this is now considered a chronic condition. It is treatable. And again, even though the mortality rate used to be very high associated with this condition, our treatments are getting better and people are living longer. 90% of the time, if you have Raynaud's phenomenon, it's probably benign, it's probably just primary Raynaud's phenomenon, but it can be associated with an underlying, more serious autoimmune disease like scleroderma, so seek medical attention. All right. And if you want some references here, I've listed them. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. I have two. Uh, the young man that you uh, examined, how did you get his mother out of the room? <laughs> <laughs> I just say, as we frequently do, oh yeah, so the question was, how do we, in pediatric or young adults, how do we help facilitate confidentiality and get the parents out of the room? So I make it a standard practice with our pediatric patients and our young adults to say that it is my routine practice to have a few minutes to spend alone with the patient. And it's nothing about the parent, it's just a routine practice that we institute at our clinic. And that way no one is offended. Okay, okay my second question. I have the hard skin on the toes, and I have the, uh, the pur purplish blue color. Uh -huh. And I thought that it was to do with uh, maybe my shoes rubbing or infection of the toes. How would I find out the difference? Yeah, so the question was, she volunteered that she notices some hardening of the toes and a purplish discoloration of her toes. So again, there can be many reasons for discoloration of the digits, including the toes, Reno's being one of them. One of the key features that your provider would ask is, do you really notice this purplish discoloration only when you feel cold? And if it's not just associated with cold and it's constant, uh, then it's less likely to be Reno's. 